Hi, this is Margaret Maloney, and welcome to the Death Dhamma Podcast. Open and honest discussions with wise and skillful teachers about their experiences with life, death, and Buddhism. If you wonder how others on the path have dealt with death and dying and grief, then be sure to listen in. Everybody has a story, a perspective, and a valuable lesson to share. Embrace death, live a full life, and learn how to love impermanence. Because as my dear father used to say, nobody gets out of this alive. Hi, everyone. Today, I am your guest and I am your host. Welcome to the Death Dhamma Podcast. And before we jump into today's episode, some updates for you. Sitting with Death is on track to be released in September. In fact, I am in the midst of selecting the book cover right now. And if you follow me on social media, on Twitter, just at Margaret Maloney, and on Facebook, there's actually a Death Dhamma podcast page, then you've had a chance to see some of the sample covers. Anyway, there were nothing but good choices. So definitely moving forward with that. And then, of course, feel free to go to margaretmaloney.com and sign up and get a free chapter from my previous book, Carpooling with Death, but that also gets you lined up so that when I release an audio chapter of Sitting with Death, you will receive a free audio chapter of that as well. Now, this has been the first season of the Death Dhamma podcast, and it's not the last season. Season one is coming to an end, but it's not over yet. But we have spoken to my 12 wise teachers, the individuals who agreed to sit with me and talk about death and grief and Buddhism. Today, from those talks, comes some ideas around death and privilege. And then our next episode will be about some common themes that came up over this past season. And then we will have a treat or two before the season wraps up. So I just want to let you know what's coming. I'll let you know that we are about, I guess, maybe three or four episodes away from the end of season one, and definitely there will be a season two. All right, on that note, let's consider the fact that in death there is privilege. And one day, not too long ago, someone left me a comment I believe it was actually on the podcast page. And this is the comment. I want to read it to you. Death is a pleasure to common and middle men. Only rich and powerful men worry much about death. They are always in glass houses for for protection. So I was appreciative that somebody took the time to share his or her thoughts with me. And I did read it a few times in order to process the comment. I'm going to read it again. Death is a pleasure to common and middle men. Only rich and powerful men worry much about death. They are always in glass houses for protection. Here are three of my takeaways from this comment. And of course, I look forward to you feeling comfortable to share your takeaways in the comment section of your favorite podcast distributor. So the first thing I thought was that this person was telling me that spending time discussing death was a pursuit for the privileged. The second thing that occurred to me is if you are not privileged, death might be welcome. And the third thing was that only wealthy people worry about death and they try to protect themselves from death, but their attempts are futile. That's the glass houses, right? Now, three people that spoke with us throughout season one, specifically called out the fact that in death there is privilege. Holly Hisamoto, who we spoke with early in the season, she mentioned it. She mentioned the fact that at that time when she was working in a hospice center, that the people who were in the hospice center were in a position of privilege because they were able to be in this situation where they were in this, like in this relationship with planned death, but that they also had excellent care and the ability to have excellent care and to have their family and friends and loved ones around them. Diane Wild mentioned it 
and Diane was a more recent interview, because she volunteers teaching the Dhamma to men and women in the California state prison system. And in the California state prison system, while a person is incarcerated, they possibly, if they are incarcerated long-term, they are going to lose loved ones and they're not going to have the ability to be with those loved ones throughout their deaths. So they may lose parents and siblings. It's uh, maybe even, you know, children and partners. Additionally, they may become ill and die and die behind bars. And then another person who brought it up was uh, Venerable Karma Lekshe Somo. And I think we interviewed her probably about mid-season. And she also talked about the fact that the way our death goes does correspond to our privilege in life. And it is true because if we have access to more material things, we have access to a different level of care. We're still all going to die. You know, death is definitely the great equalizer. But when you have more financial privilege and other kinds of privilege as well, you have more options for comfort and you are treated better. For example, if we think about um, racial privilege and racial bias, even putting money aside, it, there is definitely the possibility that someone who goes to a hospital for care may not be listened to and cared for in the same way that someone else could have. It was hard not to see my listeners' comments as another reminder to address death and privilege. And that's why we're talking about it today. That's why it jumps out as a, an important theme from the podcast and the discussions that we've had on the podcast. Maybe something for me to explore and write more about in the future. I don't know. I'm still thinking about that. Definitely open to what you think about that. But these thoughts are the beginning of opening up the discussion, the thoughts that I share with you now, with the idea that this, this is not the end of the discussion. Another way to acknowledge that there is privilege in death is to be open about the fact that there is social inequity in death. As my listener pointed out, to the less fortunate, death might be a pleasure. Peace after a difficult life. Maybe not the path up until someone's death, but the concept of death could definitely represent the end of a life full of struggle. And those who have financial and social privilege are going to die. Of course, like I said, death is the great equalizer but they will probably die with access to many more resources. When Holly mentioned it, you know, and she talked about being in that relationship with planned death, noting that each person that she worked with had access to a good level of care and the ability to receive the physical, emotional, and spiritual care to help have a peaceful death. And a few of my family members were also in a relationship with planned death. And while there was certainly a difference between the competency of the hospice teams we worked with, there was never a doubt that we would have help. We had access to excellent medical care. We had access to at-home hospice care, counseling services, and spiritual care. And I completely understand that it is due to privileges that these services were available to us. And still, it was difficult. Imagine how much more difficult it is for those who do not have the same privilege. And as we've discussed more than once, it is important to work for that peaceful death and to see if we can give our loved ones a peaceful death and to see if we can train ourselves to have a peaceful death because that peaceful death is the key to our transition to the next life, I am speaking with the thought that many of us 
are not in our last lifetime. I'm, I'm certainly not. I'm not enlightened. I'm just a person bouncing around in this world. And so, you know, how I finish my days is a really significant contributing factor to how I come back again. In my family, death has been about cancer and heart disease so far. There are people you know, whose lives end due to racial violence or because of poverty and lack of access to health care. So what some of us might consider an untimely death is an everyday occurrence in their world. We see unjust deaths occurring every day. Far too often, they are the result of social injustice. And it's not enough to see this as someone's karma coming to fruition. In fact, don't, please don't look on those who are less fortunate from a place of superiority, thinking this is their experience because they have bad karma, they earned it. Karma stems from your actions in your past lives, past actions from this life, and your current actions. When you experience negative karma, all you can do is work on your current actions. You cannot go back in time and undo the actions that contributed to your negative karma. There's no place for blame in karma. And it's not an excuse for lack of action. Suppose you look away because there has always been poverty and social injustice. Then you do not truly understand karma. Skillful actions that will help you create your own karma involve helping others. Engage in skillful actions now. In fact, recently in a session reviewing some passages from the Pali Canon with a group I study with, there was a passage talking about having unskillful equanimity. And I was having a hard time coming up with an example of for myself for what it meant to have unskillful equanimity. What was an example? And so I asked our teacher, our teacher, the Ajahn, I asked him, what is an example? And he mentioned that unskillful equanimity can be when you see someone who needs help and you don't help them. And he said, you know, when you think about that and you trace that back to your mind, that there's a place in your mind where you see someone who's struggling and you have the ability to help them and you do not help them. That's unskillful equanimity. So again, we want to engage in skillful actions. And again, skillful actions do not involve turning our back on others. If you live a life where you have the time to practice and to prepare for death, and possibly listening to my podcast, you are privileged. There is quite a bit that needed to fall into place for you to be able to practice. You had to be born as a human being in a time and place where you had access to Buddhist teachings. And you had to be able to heed those teachings. And yes, all of this fell into place for you because of your karma. If you have privilege right now, that's no guarantee that your good fortune will continue. Use your privilege wisely. If you still find it difficult to be with the dying, after sitting with death and working on your training, you can work in areas that will be of benefit. See, if you help create a world where others can have a better life path, you are also helping them with death. Suppose you volunteer in a program that makes education more accessible to at-risk youth. In that case, more of those young people will continue their educations and earn degrees or participate in vocational training, and they are more likely to support themselves in ways that allow them to exit a cycle of violence and incarceration. They will have better access to some of the services that people like myself take for granted. When you help end systemic racism and social and financial inequity, you are helping others have peaceful deaths. Equity in life is more likely to bring equity in death. And again, 
a peaceful life is more likely to lead to a peaceful death. This has been the Death Dhamma Podcast with Margaret Maloney. Thank you so much for being here. And if you liked it, please share it with your friends and your Sangha members and leave reviews. May you be well, may you be happy, may you be safe, may you be free from suffering, and may you come visit me and join my community at margaretmaloney.com, M-A-R-G-A-R-E-T-M-E-L-O-N-I, and check out Carpooling with Death, how living with death will make you stronger, wiser, and fearless. Now you can find it on Amazon in Kindle, audio, paperback, and hardback. Bye for now.